Hello, my name is Edward Sonino, and this is part three of what Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, and Donald Trump don't understand. Part three deals with Donald Trump. Donald Trump, apart from his boorishness and sophomoric behavior, he doesn't understand two very important matters in economics. One, that trade with China and Mexico are not the reasons for our unemployment though it may seem so on the surface, and two, that our budget deficits and outstanding federal debt are not a real problem, contrary to the views of conservative Republicans such as Paul Ryan. Were Trump to become president and try to shrink our trade deficit with China and Mexico through protectionism, our unemployment rate would actually rise even without a trade war which would cause a severe recession. The reason shutting off imports from China, Mexico, and elsewhere would not solve our unemployment problem is that, one, cheaper imports allow Americans to have extra money to spend on domestic goods and services. Two, many Chinese and Mexican jobs would not appeal to American workers. Three, the real cause of our unemployment has been bad economic policy, which has led to insufficient consumer income and spending. No matter what our trade deficit is, the proper stimulative fiscal and monetary policy can offset it. Enforcing trade agreements and fair trade, which Trump advocates, is necessary, but not through protectionism or trade wars. We would also slide back into recession if Trump were to try to shrink our budget deficits and federal indebtedness through a combination of higher taxes and spending cuts. Trump does not understand that what applies to business finances does not apply to federal finances. The reason being that the federal government, government can always finance itself, even through printing money, as it has with over $3 trillion of QE by the Federal Reserve, which has financed the budget deficits of recent years all by itself. The conventional wisdom that the United States depends on foreign capital to finance its budget deficits such as on Japanese capital in the 1980s and on Chinese capital more recently. That theory is an enormous fallacy. Amazingly, it perseveres even in the face of QE, which financed three years of our budget deficits. Since we have had the Fed, since we have the Fed and QE, why would we ever need foreign capital to finance our budget deficits or anything else? What Trump and Ryan also do not understand, along with the majority of the economics profession, is that all Treasury bonds purchased and held to maturity by the Federal Reserve are not real debt, only virtual debt, which costs nothing, either in terms of interest or capital. Since the Federal Reserve is a government ag agency, all the interest payments it receives from its Treasury bond holdings are returned to the Treasury annually. And whenever a Treasury bond matures, the Fed returns the capital payment back to the Treasury. In effect, all Treasury securities bought and held to maturity by the Federal Reserve correspond to printed money, not to real federal debt. Importantly, as we have seen, so long as QE, that is printed money by the Federal Reserve, is not excessive, that is, it does not produce excess aggregate demand, it is not inflationary. Without the three trillion dollars of QE to finance our recent budget deficits, we would have had a depression, just like Greece, which cannot do QE since it does not have its own national currency and sovereign central bank. The three trillion dollars of QE after the 2008-2009 recession should make everyone understand that not only does the US not depend on foreign capital to finance its budget deficits, but that the U.S. does not have a federal debt problem at all. We are not on the verge of insolvency, as Paul Ryan insists, and if we properly use QE, no federal debt will ever be passed on to future generations. In any case, Trump fails to understand that our budget deficits have been due to long recessions and high unemployment, which could have been avoided by, with a proper monetary and fiscal policy. Everyone agrees that the problem over the past five years has been insufficient consumer demand. That was due to insufficient personal income. 
So the obvious straightforward solution would have been to increase personal income through a big tax rebate. That type of fiscal stimulus has been used in the past, most recently in 2006 under the Bush administration with a modest $600 rebate per taxpayer, and should have been used in the aftermath of the 2008-2009 crisis. Why wasn't it? Especially when it could have been financed through QE, that is through printed money by the Federal Reserve at no cost to the taxpayer? Had the $800 billion 2009 Obama stimulus consisted exclusively of a tax rebate, each taxpayer would have received a $5,000 rebate uh, check. A family of two taxpayers would have received two checks totaling $10,000. That would not only have immediately stimulated consumer spending, ending the recession, it would also have stopped the housing crisis in its tracks as families in financial difficulty would have had the means to keep current on their mortgages. Clearly, QE finance tax rebates should be our standard economic stimulus policy. Their proper use would prevent long recessions and high unemployment forever. Unfortunately, Donald Trump fails to understand QE and therefore has no solution for preventing long recessions and high unemployment. Like Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump has only a very rudimentary understanding of economics. He believes he fully grasps economics because he is a businessman, but business and economics are totally different subject matters. Knowledge of one does not convey knowledge of the other. That's why businessmen rely on economists for economic forecasts, even though they are often off the mark, and why economists have never been successful businessmen. In foreign policy, Trump doesn't understand, along with short-sighted isolationists, that when the United States is not continually and intelligently engaged in promoting democracy and human rights around the world, sooner or later we find ourselves forced to engage at a much higher cost. It's like having a piece of land at risk of flooding from heavy rains and not investing in flood control infrastructure. It's like having dangerous enemies and not building up a strong military for defense and prevention. A peaceful, prosperous world, respectful of human rights and democracy, is very much in our national interest, not just for our security, but also for our economy. Just like Sanders, Donald Trump misses the point that the United States absolutely had to intervene against Saddam in order to preserve the United Nations credibility after Saddam kicked out the UN weapons inspectors. Not only to make sure Saddam had no weapons of mass destruction, as all the evidence pointed to. In fact, though forgotten by most people today, not one nation contested the belief that Saddam was, it was indeed hiding weapons of mass destruction. That belief, belief was unanimous and logical after Saddam kicked out the UN weapons inspectors. Trump also doesn't understand, like Sanders, that we had a good chance of guiding Iraq into becoming a prosperous democracy, fully respectful of human rights, but failed mostly, if not entirely, due to the ignorance and incompetence of the Bush-Cheney-Rumsfeld administration. Trump, like Sanders, would show depth if he analyzed why we failed in Iraq, with careful insight and rigorously logical analysis, instead of making the superficial claim that the intervention was a mistake simply ba based on the negative results. Superficial analysis, which both Trump and Sanders engage in, is not the mark of a person properly qualified to be president. But Donald Trump is correct when he says the United States must, must increase its defense spending in order to be militarily dominant, and when he instinctively says there is a problem with Islam, contrary to, contrary to Hillary Clinton, who, out of ignorance, denial, or political correctness, stated that the San Bernardino rampage by two extremist Muslims had nothing to do with Islam. Clinton has obviously not read the Koran or studied the history of Islam and the life of Muhammad. Common sense leads to the conclusion that Islamic terrorism against infidels is based on the Quran, the source of Islam. Without the Quran, Islam would not exist, just as Judaism and Christianity would not exist without the Bible. Had the Quran not told Muslims that Allah only loved Muslims, had it not incited Muslims to hate, despise, torture, and kill infidels, 
Had the Quran not commanded Muslims not to befriend infidels, Islamic terrorism would not exist. So while Trump's instincts lead him to correctly identify Islam itself as being the problem, his not having read the Quran and not having studied the history of Islam and the life of Muhammad prevents him from finding a solution. What Trump, Sanders, and Clinton do not understand is that the solution for many foreign policy problems is to have the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights strictly enforced. All member nations have signed it and are obligated to uphold and defend it. Religious discrimination is prohibited and the end of Islamic terrorism depends on that realization by all Islamic nations and all Muslims. Indeed, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict cannot end without that realization. The reason all land for peace negotiations have failed is that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not essentially about land. Rather, it is about religious discrimination. In fact, would there be a conflict if the Israelis were Muslim, or if the Palestinians were Jewish, or if both the Israelis and Palestinians were all atheists? Of course not. The problem is that the United Nations has never strictly enforced the human rights obligations of its members. That is the first necessary step towards having human rights upheld and defended around the world. Additionally, the United Nations has never strictly enforced its own charter, which, which requires the respect of other nations' sovereignty. Russia's invasion of Crimea and of southeastern Ukraine is a flagrant violation of the UN Charter. Yet the United Nations has not reacted, not even publicly asked Russia why it did not apply for UN-organized secession referendums in Crimea and southeastern Ukraine in order to have a peaceful, legal, democratic resolution of the issue. It is pain painfully obvious that neither Trump nor Sanders nor Clinton have ever read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the UN's Charter. That alone means that they are not qualified to be president. That alone means that they will be incapable of solving Islamic terrorism, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and incapable of successfully dealing with the multiple violations by China and Russia of human rights and the Charter, not to mention by North Korea and Iran. Very sadly, the only logical conclusion is that all three of our major presidential candidates are unqualified to be president, not having sufficient understanding of economics, finance, social, and foreign policy, and consequently not having solutions for the nation's problems. Strangely, we require doctors, lawyers, engineers, accountants, electricians, and airline pilots, for example, to demonstrate a certain level of knowledge and competence before practicing their professions. But we require no proof of a high level of knowledge and competence from our candidates for high office, for Congress, or for the presidency. That explains why we never solve our problems. That needs to be changed. Is it too much to expect of our presidents to be experts in their own right in economic, foreign, and social policy? If they're not experts in their own right, they won't be capable of properly analyzing and th synthesizing expert advice from within their administrations and from the outside, and of coming up with solutions, as we've seen over and over. Thank you for your attention.